Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We have an n-dimensional random vector whose components are IID standard Gaussian random variables. The objective is to show that if n is large enough, the L to norm of vector x is very close to the square root of n with high probability. To prove this, consider beta, a positive real number between 0 and 1. The probability of this event can be made arbitrarily close to 1. By choosing a large enough n, the event itself is that the L to norm of vector x is between 1 minus beta times the square root of n and 1 plus beta, the square root of n. For every beta, no matter how close it is to 0, there is a sufficiently large n so that the lower bound on this probability is within any arbitrary positive epsilon from 1. Let's consider the complement event, that the absolute value of the difference between the L to norm and the square root of n exceeds beta times the square root of n. Multiply both sides of this inequality by the positive quantity, the square root of n plus the L to norm of vector x. The left-hand side becomes the absolute value of the L to norm squared minus n. The right-hand side is beta square root n, the L to norm of x plus beta n. This is greater than beta n. If the absolute value of the L to norm of vector x minus square root n exceeds beta square root n, then the absolute value of the L to norm squared minus n exceeds beta n. The probability of this event is an upper bound on the probability of that event. We want a lower bound on this probability. This is equivalent to an upper bound on that probability. The first step of our bounding is to use the probability of this event. It's easier to deal with the L to norm squared rather than dealing with the L to norm itself. We use the Chernoff bound. This event is the union of two events. The first of them is that the L to norm squared of vector x minus n is greater than beta n. The other event is that this difference is less than minus beta n. Multiply both sides of this inequality by positive real number t. Exponentiate both sides. This event is equivalent to that event, as the exponential is a monotonically increasing function. Apply the Markov inequality to this probability. It is upper bounded by the expectation of this random variable, e to the t times the L to norm squared of vector x. We need to divide by this threshold value. So we multiply the expectation by e to the minus t beta n plus n. This expectation is the expectation of e to the t x1 squared plus x2 squared all the way to xn squared. e to the t x1 squared is the moment generating function of the random variable x1 squared. Thus, we are interested in the expectation of e to the t y squared when y is a standard Gaussian random variable. Zero mean and unit variance. This expectation is the integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the t y squared. We multiply by the PDF of y, which is 1 over square root 2 pi e to the minus y squared over 2. We can combine these two exponentials as e to the minus y squared over 2, 1 minus 2t. For this integral to have a finite value, we need this part here to be strictly positive. This expectation is finite when t is strictly less than 1 half. Do the change of variables, z equal to y squared over 2, 1 minus 2t. Y is square root 2 times square root z divided by the square root of 1 minus 2t. dy is this part here times 1 half z to the minus half dz. The integral with respect to z is gamma of 1 half. Recall that gamma of x, when the real part of x is strictly positive, is equal to the integral z from 0 to infinity, z to the power x to the minus 1, e to the minus z. Gamma of 1 half is the square root of pi. Simplifying the answer, we get that this expectation is 1 minus 2t to the power minus 1 over 2. For this expectation to be finite, t should be less than 1 half. Also, t should be positive. So t is in the open interval between 0 and 1 half. The expectation with the L to norm squared is the expectation of e to the t x1 squared, e to the t x2 squared, and so on. These random variables are independent. The expectation of the product is the product of expectations. The random variables are also identically distributed. So this expectation for every g is 1 minus 2t to the power minus half. When this function of t is multiplied by itself n times, we get 1 minus 2t to the power minus n over 2. This can be written as e to the minus n over 2, the natural logarithm of 1 minus 2t. After evaluating the expectation, this is the upper bound. It's a function of t. Note that any value of t between 0 and 1 half is a valid upper bound. If we are interested in the least upper bound, the tightest upper bound, we choose t in this interval such that the upper bound is minimized. This is equivalent to obtaining t in the open interval from 0 to 1 half that maximizes this part here. Let's call this function of t, g of t. The first derivative of g with respect to t 
is beta n plus n. We need also to differentiate this part. That's n over 2. The derivative of log 1 minus 2t is 1 over 1 minus 2t. By the chain rule, we have minus 2 here. The derivative of this part is minus n over 1 minus 2t. We solve for t to make the first derivative equal to 0. We get that 1 minus 2t is 1 over beta plus 1. t is 1 half beta over beta plus 1. Note that we have just differentiated g of t and equated the first derivative to 0, ignoring this constraint here. We relaxed the problem to make it simple. The good news is that this value of t is the constraint maximizer of the function g of t. Beta over beta plus 1 is a positive real number less than 1. So this solution is between 0 and 1. Moreover, if we compute the second derivative of g, we get a negative value. This value of t maximizes g of t and satisfies this constraint. Take this value of t and plug it in. Here is the upper bound. It depends on beta and n. Let's try to obtain a simpler function of beta in the upper bound. Define each of delta as delta minus log 1 plus delta minus delta squared over 4. Delta is between 0 and 1. We can show that this function is non-negative. Take the first derivative with respect to delta. Combine the terms and simplify. We get that the first derivative is delta times 1 minus delta over 2 times 1 plus delta. If delta is in the open interval between 0 and 1, the first derivative is strictly positive. The function is increasing, which means that h of delta is greater than or equal to h of 0. When delta is 0, we have 0 minus log 1 minus 0. That's 0. So h of delta is indeed non-negative. So delta minus log 1 plus delta is greater than or equal to delta squared over 4. If we multiply both sides by minus 1, we get that minus delta minus log 1 plus delta is less than or equal to minus delta squared over 4. Replace delta by beta and multiply by n over 2. This is the exponent that we get. The probability that the L2Rome squared minus n exceeds beta n is upper bounded by e to the minus n beta squared over 8. Our event of interest was that the absolute value of the L2Rome squared minus n exceeds beta n. The other possibility is that the L2Rome squared of vector x minus n is less than minus beta n. Big a positive t. Multiply both sides by minus t. So the inequality is reversed. Exponentiate. Apply the Markov inequality. This probability is upper bounded by the expectation of e to the minus t times the L2Rome squared of vector x. We need to multiply the expectation by the reciprocal of the threshold. This expectation is what we have on page 1. The difference is that t is replaced by minus t. Rather than having log 1 minus 2t, now we have log 1 plus 2t. We follow the same procedure. This is a valid upper bound for every positive t. Let's hunt for t that makes the upper bound smallest. Equivalently, we want the value of positive t such that this function of t is maximized. We define the function g bar of t. We obtain the maximum. Now it occurs at t equal to 1 half times beta over 1 minus beta. We use this value of t to have an upper bound that depends on beta and n. To simplify this function of beta, we define the function h bar of delta equal to delta plus log 1 minus delta plus delta squared over 4. Delta is non-negative and is less than 1. We differentiate, simplify the first derivative to discover that it is negative when delta is in the open interval between 0 and 1. This function is decreasing. So this function is upper bounded by its value at 0. 0 plus log 1 plus 0, that's 0. This function is non-positive. Delta plus log 1 minus delta plus delta squared over 4 is less than or equal to 0. This means that beta plus log 1 minus beta is less than or equal to minus beta squared over 4. The upper bound on this probability is e to the power n over 2 times minus beta squared over 4. The exponent is minus n beta squared over 8. The event that the absolute value of the L2Rome squared of vector x minus n exceeds beta n is the union of these two events. The probability of the union is upper bounded by the sum of probabilities, and each one of those probabilities is upper bounded by e to the minus n beta squared over 8. The probability of this event is upper bounded by 2 times e to the minus n beta squared over 8. If we multiply both sides by minus 1, the inequality is reversed. Add 1 to both sides. The left-hand side is the probability of the event that the absolute value of the L2Rome squared minus n is less than or equal to beta n. From the argument on page 1, the probability of the event that the absolute value of the L2Rome minus square root n less than or equal to beta square root n is lower bounded by this quantity. Given any positive beta between 0 and 1, no matter how small, 
we can reduce the value of this part by increasing n. When we do so, we can make the lower bound on this probability as close to one as we wish. If x is a high dimensional vector, with very high probability, the L2 norm of vector x is very close to the square root of n, the square root of the dimension of the vector space in which random vector x results.